running, and, uh, and I'm like, I said, hey, are you nervous about jumping? He's like, oh. And I'm like, I don't know if I told him, but, but I was so scared at that point that my legs were buckling. Like, you, you couldn't tell, but my legs felt like wet wheels, and I was like, oh, Welcome to Mindset Lessons from the Field. I'm Gina Kazaza, the author of the upcoming memoir, Training with a SEAL. Today's guest is a former Navy SEAL officer who served for nine years. After his military career, he transitioned into the corporate world working for companies like IBM and for startups. One was a small team where he successfully grew a 15,000-person organization. $400 $400 million company to a $31,000, $1.2 billion powerhouse in just 10 years. Currently, he is the CEO of Location Tech, a company specializing in wireless panic button systems for buildings. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm really excited to introduce you to Jeff Engel. Jeff, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks, Gina. It's fun to be here. I, I, I shouldn't talk about this, but the pre-conversation, just really enjoyed getting to know you. <laughs> So, uh, Yo, I'm, I'm really, I'm glad we did that too, because I just, um, I'm excited to talk to you because I find you really interesting. Like all the stuff that you say really resonated. I watched a couple of your interviews, obviously, um, beforehand. And a lot of this stuff really resonated, um, because I'm kind of going through a lot of the stuff that you talk about through, a new business and, you know, the, my own business for like my, my books and my speaking. I want to go to like kind of the beginning, not like the super beginning, but like when you were scared of heights, didn't go to the Navy, you, you were just like, you know, you passed on it just because of that fear and you're around 22 and you didn't want to have a regret because of a fear. What was going on through your mind when you passed on it and then... How long did it take you to realize I got to face this fear? When I went to college, so it was a military school and a Naval Academy. And so we were walked down, there was, we walked down the hallways and they have some of these things kind of like talking about the Marine Corps and force recon and, and some other stuff. And, and I remember, and this was probably my sophomore or junior year looking at it and going, oh, force recon, you got a parachute. I'm not doing that. I'm going over here. I was just so afraid of heights. Like, like, like I, I used to. You put, I, I can't walk on a glass floor if it's up high or look over the edge. I, I just get used to buckle. I've always swam my whole life. I've always been very much a water person and just very, I shouldn't be on the water. I should be in the water. And there was just something inside me that said, yeah, I want to be a SEAL. And I kind of got caught up in trying for it. And I was two days, two days away from, or maybe a week away from getting a billet. And I told the, the SEAL recruiters, like, I, I, it's not for me. And um, and then I, I ended up picking surface ships, being on surface navy, which probably a great great job. But I knew that when I was 65, 80 years old, I would regret it and try it. And so it was the regret, the fear of regretting, that I knew I was always going to regret. And and part of it came about when I was on the ships, and I'd hear someone say. Oh, I was going to do that, but it's kind of like, oh, I spread my arm, but I can't do this anymore. And, uh, well, I think you just did bend your arm. And if you can do it, then go do it. If you can't do it, then shut up. Don't talk about it. Like, if you can do it, go do it. What happened was I was actually with one of my, my, my best friends. And I was with his brothers. And we, were do- and we were actually shooting. I said, oh, I could have done that. And I'm like, well, what the hell did I just say? Like, I just, I just said what I hate when everyone else says that. And I'm like, I got to go. I, 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 just, I just broke a truth of mine. Kind of turned around. And this was six months after being on ships and kind of, kind of, oh, I don't know if it was six or a year. And then kind of figured it out. And then, to make a long story short, I checked into the ship just before, like five days before my CO did. My CO checked in. I said, hey, Captain. He pulled me to the ship to help him with this thing. And I was there for three years with him. And I said, hey, I kind of want to go seals. He kind of looked at me as like, you jerk. <laughs> I just did a pull a bunch of strings to get you here. And so anyways, he was very nice about it. He helped me transfer. And I think by turning it down initially and then really processing what I had done and really accepting it, 
it helped me get over my fears of that it was because it was going to hold me back. Like I was, I was, I, I knew for a fact that I was going to regret and, and I, I could have been, if I'd stayed in, I could have been great or I, I, I would have been an okay, okay sailor as, as on ships, but I could have been just as good as a seal. And I, and I think from a regret standpoint, I was really going to regret it later in life, really going to regret it. And, and, and it's kind of like, my whole philosophy as much as I can. When I'm 85, 90, I don't want to look back with regrets. And it doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. It just means that don't leave something on the table that you're going to regret if you can, if you can adjust it. I have a couple of questions from it, but the one I really want to ask you is, how was it then the first time you jumped out of a plane? Oh, actually, jumping out of the airplane wasn't bad. So jump school's three weeks long. You do like this first, the first week you literally jump on out of a, like a three foot sandbox or three box size little thing. No problem. I got that. And the next one is you're in the swing landing trainer and it's about 30 feet up in the air and you're, you're strapped in and you jump out and you act, you jumped out the door. Like that was fine. I can see everything. It's all connected. And where you land, you're on the ground. So yeah, not a big deal. So anyways, that week I'm running and I still remember the guy that I was running with, Paul Guyberson. Paul probably doesn't remember me. And he's like, I don't remember anything that Jeff and I talked about, but this one time I'm running with Paul and we had just finished Bud. So we were pretty in pretty good shape. We were pretty strong and all that stuff. But I'm, I'm running along and I have my glasses on. I'm running and, uh, and I'm like, I said to him, hey, are you nervous about jumping? He's like, no. I'm like, I don't know if I told him, but, but I was so scared at that point that my legs were buckling. Like you, you couldn't tell. But my legs felt like wet noodles. And I was like, holy smokes, this is going to suck. But part of it was, you, you can't go there as a, as a Bud's graduate and not jump out the door. <laughs> like, <laughs> you now, it's no longer Jeff's reputation. It's the whole SEAL community. And if you don't freeze, you've done so much damage to the community. It was probably as much as getting going the momentum and it no longer became about me. It, it what about, I'm representing a group of people, and if I quit, then, man, that is that is shameful. No, I, I was pretty petrified. Joke is, when you first jump out of, out of an airplane, the like the first time, but the second, third, and maybe fourth, or night jumps, and they joke about that because your eyes are closed. Um, but I, I never, never closed my eyes jumping, and once you get up in the airplane, you just cowboy up and go out the door. It's the fear before you actually have to do it that gets you in the... Mm-hmm in the piece. And so when at the end, when I've, towards the end, like I, I have a picture of my, my last jump and I put a, I had a big smile on my face and that, and I realized that was one of the tricks I used to do. I'd, I'd get there for something I didn't want to do. I'd put a smile on my face and it would help change my behaviors and humor. One of the best things that the, the darker, the, the darker the environment, meaning the more oppressive, the better the humor gets. So some of the, some of the most funniest events that I had was when it was the more the more miserable the better the jokes were the better the humor was do you have a time that you recall it was like really miserable for you where you're like <laughs> this this sucks more than anything <laughs> sure well, I, there's more than a few but like anything I, I kind of looked at buds so whatever the whatever the percent is 25 or 20 percent or or 90 percent if 90% or 20% make it through, that means someone has to make it through. 99% or 100% or 1%. Someone has to make it through. So why not be the percent that makes it through? Even if it's 1%. Well, someone has to do it. We're not talking about the first person to swim across the English Channel. That's different. Someone's done it. So if someone's done it, then it could be done. Nothing that that I've done hasn't been done in some form or fashion. So I remember like at Bud's, there was... There was really nothing that I hadn't done on my own. I just hadn't done it all back to back to back. And there was really nothing that I hadn't done in when I was in the SEALs, it just made me in a different form. I've, I've walked through a field and I've walked through a forest, but I had never walked through a jungle that had triple canopy, meaning three layers of vegetation on top at night. So it's literally pitch black. So when you step on something, you can't tell if it's gonna support your weight. So I remember this one guy, Rod Hooks, who I was just at his retirement. We were on a patrol and he weighs a little bit more than me. I stepped on some stuff and and it carried my weight. He stepped, placed his foot on it, and then he fell into a five-foot hole. The funny story is he fell so hard he bent his, he's bent his rifle, and we didn't know he bent his rifle until he went to the shooting range, and, 
And he started going, why, why, why are all my shots off? And then we figured out he did. But the whole pieces we're going to go back to is I've done each one of those pieces. Like I've walked in, I've walked in a trail, I've walked in a forest, and maybe not a triple canopy. I've walked at night. So like all the parts are, are stuff that you've probably done. It just may not be in that bundle, but you can find enough commonality of like, oh, I've done 75% of this before. I haven't done exactly like this. And when you look at this by itself, like, oh, that's going to be scary. But I've done 75% of this already, so it's only 25% it's new. So by breaking the problem down or breaking the evolution down, it becomes much easier. I want to ask you from Bud's, from what I heard from an interview, you were in a lot of the goon squads, or you were in <laughs> all of the goon squads, right? So were you ever concerned that you weren't going to make it or like get caught due to performance? Did you ever get down on yourself because you were in the goon squad? I mean, I just know from when I was training... I was last all the time. I mean, like, and when I mean last, I mean, like, they could order a pizza by the time I got back, okay? Well, so, 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 so it was funny. So I was on, so Mark Devine, who, um, he, he was, yeah. I think he was, he was at SEAL Team 3 at the same time I was. And okay. um, so we, we are, are, we definitely overlapped. And he was on, someone talked about it. He was like, oh, like, because he, 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 he was never gooned. Like, he never made the goons. Well. Like, he could run, he could do all that stuff. So he kind of equated it as like, oh, yeah, goon squads where losers are. And I'm like, oh, no, I like the goon squad because, and, and there was an, uh, Derek Van Orden, who's a, who's a congressman now, was in my buds class. Because what ended up happening was I, I was not a great runner. So we'd, we'd start and the pack, I, and I could, I could, I'd be just behind the pack. A lot of times the instructor's are like, okay, we're going to cut the line off. And then Jeff's the first person who gets gooned. Like it's, and then we just start gooning everyone else. And so, okay, just put me through another form of exercise. Hell week is just one evolution after the next. Okay, go to the next one. Go to the next one. And goon squad is, okay, we're done with the run. Now we're going to do the next training exercise. Okay, so what? And Derek, Derek, would, he wouldn't laugh at me, but he could always tell like if I had if I'd been doing something extra. Like one weekend I went out and I, I didn't party, but I was just spending too much time at the time. I had a girlfriend at the time, and I was spending too much time not sleeping, not preparing. He, he came up to me towards this was in third phase. He came up to the end. He's like, "What happened to you? Like, you normally smoke everyone in the goon squad." Because I'm like, I get that. I was like, "Let's go." Everyone else gets kind of depressed. So I'm like, "New evolution, new day. Let's go." And uh, and he goes, "What happened to you? Like, you, you weren't doing so well in the goon squad." And that's the point. I was like, "Oh, yeah. I need to get my sleep." Not get enough sleep, not good. Any evolution you get caught up, if you're not number one, then so what? Like, and you're getting gooned, so what? It's not going to kill you. Like, it's literally, none of the stuff's going to kill you. And if it does, well, okay. I mean, and by the way, I'm not trying to be morbid. By the way, I'm not, I'm not a super upbeat guy or like, oh, this, the, look at how beautiful everything is. Like, it's just like, that's the next evolution. Next evolution. Okay, let's do our best and, and, and figure out what do you have to do to get out of the goon squad? Put out harder than anyone else and win and you get out of the goon squad. Okay. Or you can not try and be a little slower and do five or six evolutions and then and then the beating gets worse. Figure out the evolution, figure out what you have to do. I mean, so I, I actually did okay in Buds from the standpoint of I, I wasn't the honor man, but I was surprisingly surprising myself, I was close to the top and it was because I could swim. I mean I was very comfortable in the water and most swims I was top top tier so any swimming evolution i was fine on obstacle course i wasn't top but i wasn't the bottom runs i was okay at but to, to i mean but i definitely had to put out and run to make the times i actually I actually thought buds was kind of one of the better parts of my life <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and not 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 for a morbid reason but all you do is you're paid to work out and eat and work out and you had yeah. to do some education. So you didn't have a lot of distractions. It wasn't a bad, it's not a bad, like, of course, it's miserable and stuff. A lot of ways, it wasn't that bad. It could, it could have been worse. Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah so. like your, uh, your philosophy, I really like where it's like, you know, well, that, this sucked less than something else I could oh. have been doing. Yeah. You know? Oh, so, so I remember during Hell Week, and I, I think I've talked about this one before. We were, so the instructors come up to me, and, mm -hmm. and we're freezing, and I don't know what it was, but it was really cold. And like, hey, I don't know what, if it was Lieutenant Engel or whatever, or Mr. Engel, I don't know what it was. But they said, hey, you know, you could, you, could, you could quit right now, and you can go get a warm cup of coffee and be on that ship. And I was like, oh, hell no. That place is miserable. I'd rather get paid to work out and get beaten 
than to be on a ship. And but not 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 a bad life. It's just not the life I wanted. Like I'd been there, done that. Being on the surface navy is a tough life. Like it's tough. I mean, if you love being at sea, then it's great. Yeah. So it's funny. Like the things that people try and punish you and try and make you feel bad is like, oh no, that that's that's worse. That sucks worse. You serve with some some really great. You had some great teammates um, that you serve oh. with. And you mentioned to, well, in the beginning of this interview, you know, you, you know, your life could have been in a totally different path had you not decided to, to go and give this a shot, right? So one of the things that I want to ask you um, that I listened to in an interview where you mentioned a lot of the lessons that you learn, you take with you, and that's how you are successful in, your, in the corporate life, in the, in the companies that you've done. So what do you feel that you've that you've learned that translates well into the civilian life. I don't know if we talked about this prior, but uh, JP, John Paul DeHorio, which he's, uh, if you've ever heard of Paul Mitchell Hair Care, um, mm-hmm. which is the white bottles with the black labeling. And there's actually a whole story behind why he picked white bottles and black labeling because mm-hmm. it's least expensive. And then he also did Patron. So I, I was I was driving him to the airport one time. And at the time, I think he had like 12 to 15, 18 different companies that he was running or he was involved with. And I was like, how do you do that? Like, I have a hard time doing one job. And he said, you got to learn the language. He goes, if you learn the language of that area, you can do it. And business, business is business. So you need, to, you need to make more money than you spend. And so you need to grow your revenue and cut your costs and all that stuff. So that's the same. But the language is different. The lesson that JP taught me, and it's it's been it's been probably one of the fundamental things to it. And, and I, I had a chance, and he doesn't remember, but I had a chance to talk to thank him about a year ago. Like, thank you for that. And he and obviously he didn't remember me who I was. And it was on the phone. But it was learning the language of where you have to go. And so anyone transitioning, and I don't care if it's the military or anywhere else, but if you're transitioning into a new discipline or a new role or you want to. You have to learn the language of the people you're going to. So if you want to become a supply chain person, you have to under, understand and speak supply chain. If you want to become a marketer, you have to understand the words of marketing. One of my roles was I did in-store marketing, in-person, how someone engaged marketing items, how do you get one more, one more item into a shopping cart. But then I had to go into this world where I start pushing new products into the digital world. So it's still marketing, but it's a different language. So I so I took five months of, cl- of, of classes through the University of Illinois Urbana all in digital marketing. And it helped me convert the physical marketing language to the digital new media marketing language. And going, oh, different terms, same thing. And so I learned to speak the language. So early on, I was a supply chain guy, then a, mar- then a physical marketing guy, in- in-store present marketing guy. Then I learned the, the language of digital marketing and so it's going back and learning language, the education. And so I do go back to school for classes every so often. First one after military was MBA, but that was really the real core classes with three classes around around procurement supply chain. That got me into IBM. Then and then I learned how to sell to take it through that. I learned by kind of grit and termination, not great at it until I actually learned a process, which is Miller Hyman, which helped me tremendously. And so Vince McFarland taught me that. I still talk to him all the time. And there's lessons, but you have to keep learning. You have to learn the language. So anyone who's transitioning, it doesn't matter if you transition from the military to the civilian world or you're transitioning from, from tech to um, retail, you have to learn the language of the pace and verticals, hospitality to retail, et cetera. And so within six months, you can learn one language of wherever you're going. But you have to learn the language. I heard that one of the companies, I don't know if it's the current one or a different one, but you mentioned like the first four years was very, very brutal. At what point do you go, this isn't going to work? Like, you know, it's like, I'm going to keep going till it works. But at what point, like, is quitting okay? Or it's like, okay, I got to just end this company and try something else. You have to look at what the market's telling you. The market will tell you if it's viable or not. Not if you have a good idea. The market will tell you. And so you say, well, how do you know the market? So like what I'm what I'm currently doing is R2S, real-time locating services. So it's basically, and my the people on my tech team hate it when I use this analogy. But on your phone, when you have this little dot that follows you on Google Map, that little dot is location services in the outside world. As soon as you walk into a building, that goes away. What RTLS is is really that dot. And it's not exactly like this, but it's that dot of where are you in a building. So what we do is we do what floor, we can get you what floor and what room you're in in a building. 
So if someone, and I need to update my, my background, but if someone pushes a button on a panic button, this within a building, they know where they are. And I'm looking for the end or on this panic button or on this modal radio. This is a little small wearable that has a little button. And so this, we don't do anything with this hardware except for when you push this button to do the location, it's the same as pushing this button for location. So it goes and it gives you your right floor and room location. So if you can do it mobile, then you can do it in fixed location. So back to your question is how do you know to keep going? There's a report from Gartner, which is does a lot of industry look at, that says, so the space we're in, in 2021 was 1.9 billion. By 2030, it'll be 55 billion globally. So, and it, it gives things for asset tracking and people tracking, et cetera. I was like, I know where we are. Like, so we're, we're part of a $55 billion industry and now it's doing it. So I did another business that was around food and beverage packaging and it was a great idea creative but there was no metrics on how I was going to make it. And we, we, uh, we got ourselves in Dodger Stadium and, and Yankee Stadium. And we got ourselves in 7-Eleven, et cetera, and Auntie Anne's. Like, it, it was good. We were, we were doing great. It was a, a niche play that wasn't going to grow, that wasn't going to be a billion-dollar enterprise. And so it's really a decision on – and nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with having, having a company that, that produces – that gives you enough money to live off of. Like, great. Lots of people do that and have a great life. It was going to be struggling to get to the next level. And so I shut that one down because the, the indicators, the market was, wasn't was grasping it hard enough to do that. What we're doing now with the RTLS is the market's there. Like, so you think about it, everything that's, that's done outside in the way of collecting in, intelligence on movement outside is coming to the inside world. It is coming to inside buildings. And it's not Big Brother tracking you, et cetera. Like, that's not what it is. Like, because, like, this button here, you're not tracked. Or this, the radio, you're not tracked until you push the button. When you say, I need help. And by the way, it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that something's wrong. It could be you're a school teacher and Sally or, or Bob or Pat skin their knee. So you push the button. And so, um, and but you stay with the, you stay with the kid. And then you can start talking to them like, hey, Sally, Bob, or Pat skin their knee, and can you bring some band-aids, but I don't want to leave them because they're crying, et cetera. And, of course, they need, you, at that point with a little kid, you need to give them attention. But you may be in a high school where you're like, hey, I'm breaking up a fight, which hopefully it doesn't happen, but you're breaking up a fight. Like, you don't want to be talking to anyone while you're trying to, like, focus on the event in front of you. So, like, this is a better one where you just push the button, and they come know where you are, and don't talk to me because I'm paying attention to what's going on in front of me. Or this one, you push the button, and maybe you do want to talk to them, tell you, like if you're part of the services. So it, there's different tools for different environments for different use cases. And so, but our focus is really around the software that drives that. So now the, the question you asked me is, how do you know? I have outside indicators, outside reports to tell me the market for this space is $55 billion. So now I need to figure out how do I get us to be have a slice of that pie? at this, And so... There's ways to do this for self-funding or get venture funding or private equity funding. And luckily, I've kind of done all those things. So I kind of know what's going to be best to get me where I want to go without giving up a big chunk of the company. And more importantly, making sure that the, the teammates that are with me on this journey, making sure they get taken care of. I like how you said that because I was listening to an interview when you talked about taking care of like your pain last or something you were mentioning, like, you know, like you eat last. So ever, because if you eat first, then, you know, you forget that you were hungry and then, you know, you forget about your other, like you just satisfied yourself, but you forget your team was also hungry or is also hungry. And I want to just talk about like the lessons that you learned. I definitely butchered that by the way, um, on team teamwork and that translate to you being able to run such a successful company and serve so many people. I mean, from a company going from 15,000 to 31, that's, that's a big jump. This sounds so, I, I, I almost, I don't know how to explain this because everyone's like, oh, that's such a cookie butter answer. Of course they said that. But most leaders, most C-level folks are narcissists. So I, I hate to say that, but if you, look, you look at the stats, it's all about them self-serving. And by the way, there's lots of folks that, that, that I can point to that, that are not that way. But they learn that's the line you got to give is like, oh, it's about everyone else. It's about everyone else. I think about the team I'm with now. I, I just give that caveat. Like the team I'm with now, sure, I, I'm the CEO of the company. 
a lot of times I'm just the figurehead to help help block and tackle and get things out of the way so they can do the job. Because when it comes to system architecture discussions, I'm not the leader of that discussion. I, I just try and hang on mentally to hold on to understand what they're saying. And I'm hoping I can understand what they say when they get done. And, and luckily they're kind enough, so I do follow along. And then we have the lead software guy, like he's the lead for that. He's leading that charge. And then the head of product leading the charge in that. And then the hit Q and A, like those are different leadership roles at any given time, someone else is leading. And that goes back to when I was in my platoons and we had a point man. He was leading. We also had a breacher that at certain times he was leading. And, and I do use he because at the time there's only guys in the SEALs. And I had the, the radio guy, radio man, and he was the leader when it came to radios. And sure, we all we were all cross-trained and all that stuff, but there's certain times someone's the leader for that section. Someone's the leader for that section. Someone's the leader for that section. And so everyone amongst the group are really peers. It just happens to be when you're forward-facing, sometimes you have to put someone in front so that others outside know, like, who's the, who's the lead person I got to talk to? So when I want to go yell at someone, I go yell at them. Your job is to take it on the chin and protect your guys as much, the men and women, as much as you can. So I, one of the quietest people in my group, she, she, never, she doesn't talk much. But when she talks, man, do I listen. <laughs> like, Because like, I know her words matter. And I can tell you when she goes away on vacation or something goes away because I can, I just feel it that things kind of like don't work as well. So it's not the loudest person in the room. It's not it's not the person who's talking or whatever else. Everyone uniquely brings something unique to the table. And at any given time, someone is leading and it's not always the same person. And as, as a leader, the best thing you do is shut up and get out of the way. Like seriously, just get out of the way because you're just gonna get in the way and screw it up. And just give them the air cover to go do what they do well. And if they can't do it on their own, then they're not right for the team. And, and that's the part, if they're not right for the team, you need to go have the conversation with them. I'm going to go back to the plane on like facing that fear, right? Of, you know, and then it's just like, okay, I just, I did it, right? And I, not that bad, right? And then it's like, how do you face like a uncomfortable conversation? Those things that are a different type of fear. Some people are scared of confrontation and things like that. Like, how do you face something like that? Well, I'll tell you, you're never good at the first time you do it. And you look back from if you do something 10 times, pretty confident the first time you do it, you're going to be horrible and you need to get better. Letting people go. Like I was proud for a long time. I never had to let anyone go. And then I started getting roles where I had to start letting people go. And and I, I didn't do it so gracefully at first. I worked on it and got better because I, I didn't like the outcome of how I felt afterwards. Because I didn't feel like I, because it, like having to let someone go, that doesn't mean they're a bad person. And there's lots of reasons why someone may not be part of the team. Business to me is, is just a sport. It's just a sport. It's like kickball. So, and, and I, I use this analogy. So you have two teams, you have 21 people that want to play and there's two teams of eight. And so you have eight people picked and the five people left over, that's unemployment. And now you have the two teams. You have the red team and the blue team. Blue team wins. Red team's all pissed off at each other. Like some people get fired off because get fired. You get some of the, you, some people get fired. You get, you pull some people from unemployment. They switched out. Some of these people get unemployed. The blue, t- whoever this team is, like they're happy to high five each other. But there's a dog. There's always, in every team, there's always a dog that gets kicked. And, and, and what, and typically they get blamed for stuff even when it's not their fault. Like, oh yeah, that person's a jerk, whatever else. So they're incompetent because it's easier to let, to have kick the dog than sometimes accept accountability. And so there's all these things. But at the end of the day, how did the team captains get picked? Who knows? But somehow the team captains got picked and somehow they got put in that position. And the team captains picked the teams. And this team captain didn't get the right team together. And whatever reason, maybe it's because the key person got picked here over first and they flipped a coin. Who knows? You don't know. And so if you're not so if you don't if you're not part of the team you, you get kicked off the team or something else, it's like ah oh, who cares it's just a sport but like I have a hard time when it happens to me I have a hard time accepting it but but you, like work and all that stuff you can't take too serious and by the way I need to listen to my own advice so <laughs> business is just like kickball like you don't know who's going to be team captains 
And it's really about relationships. And if the team, this team over here, the dog, if the team likes you, you're not going to be the dog. But if you, but if you kind of like stand out, like the nail needs to be hammered down, you can easily do that. So you have to think about, do you want, are, are these people your friends? They, do you want to be with them? Like, are they the right group to work with? There's just so many dynamics in business and there's just so many dynamics in kickball. It's just a sport. And just, did you give it your best shot? <laughs> when you went up to kick the ball, did you give it your best shot? And if you didn't, well, try better next time. And by the way, try better next time just is not like really try. It's like, think about what can I do better next time? Like, did I not put my foot, did I not place my foot next to the ball when I kicked it? Right? Or, or what, or, or I kick with my toe or I kick with my instep. Like all, all the things that you learn if you play soccer, because when you started kicking a ball in soccer, you're much worse early on than you were later on. So everything's evolution, everything's better. So back to the original question, um, yeah, letting people go or tough situations, those are tough. Or anything new in business, it's tough the first time you do it, but you learn and you reflect. Now, how did you do throughout your time? Um, like I heard, like, you know, the military is really good at um, getting you uh, used to failure. It's like they purposely fail you, right? They set you up for failure. So you, they see how you do and you react and all that stuff. Is there any lessons that you learned or did it ever, is there a story where like it really counted? Like this was now like we're not in training anymore where something happened that, affected you and then how do you like let that go like you know like if you're failing at something you fail at something and then it's just like you dwell on it and you think about it like how do you let that go and not let it affect you yeah there was um in a podcast the other day that someone you just said the word let it go and and i thought that was really really simple and, and sage advice so if you can identify the root like you've got to get to the root cause of whatever whatever the issue is, and if you could package it and you can clearly identify, go that's it, then you can address it. And so there's what's called the five whys. Example: the car didn't start. Well, why didn't the car start? First question is: Well, the battery was dead. Well, why was the battery dead? You keep going through all the steps. And the last one was was because the the ground cable wasn't wasn't um, the bolt on the ground cable wasn't tight. As an example, well, why wasn't it tight? Because the manual didn't say you needed to check it. Oh. The root cause is the manual. It wasn't the bad battery. It was the manual didn't tell you to tighten it right. So you've got to get to the root cause. So you ask it's from you ask the five whys to get to really the root cause. If you can't get the root cause, then you're solving this problem or this problem, which isn't the fundamental issue. And so until you get to here, you're letting go of the wrong things. But if you can figure out to get to here, then you're let then you can let go of the of the of the problem, and then and then you can help move on. So and that's the hard thing. Yeah, I mean, I just analyzing and identifying and also, you know, it also takes a lot of accountability too that they don't want to do either. Like sometimes they just don't want to ask those questions because they don't want to get to the root cause. They just rather blame something else. Oh, it's easier. I'm starting to become more comfortable saying this. Like I don't remember a lot. And part of that is I ruminate a lot. I don't know if it's a good trade or not. But I, I'm always thinking about the business and always thinking about throwing it out there and solving that. Like, how do I get to the 55 billion? How do I get so that I actually have a meaningful slice of the 55 billion? And how do I get to the steps there? And by the way, that's a long ways off, but that's like, but how do you get, but you've got to get the steps to get there. And so I'm always thinking about that. So there's other things where I don't do as well in, and I'm not saying I do this well, but I'm saying there's other things that if I'm always ruminating about this, or I'm all, it's heavy on my mind, or just thinking about it, there's other things that I miss, like when I'm having conversations with people, I sometimes, like my brain just does not suck those things in, unless it's a big memory. Unless it's a big event, I don't always remember it that well. The point I'm way off task is, is you have to figure out what works for you, and you have to figure out how you think, and then be okay to accept who you are and how you think and all that stuff. And some problems you just may not want to solve. You just may not be worth the effort. You can't solve everything. But focus on things that, that matter for you. So when you, so like when I'm 85, like, yeah, I regret I didn't solve that. Or, yeah, I didn't care. Who cares? Like, I don't remember that exact conversation I had with my son or with my kids. But I remember we had a great time. <laughs> okay. And so I just kind of try and keep things in the in my brain power that I know I can process and the things I can solve and recognize or some things. I'm just not going to be great at memorizing stuff. Like, we talked about earlier, movie lines. Like, don't ask me to memorize something. Like, not going to happen. But if you ask me to freestyle, I can do okay. 
if you give me the subject and I can think about it, I can do okay. But do not ask me to memorize lines. I just know that's – and maybe it's a mental block. Probably is. But I've decided I'm not going to be able to memorize stuff. Okay. Not going to be part of my repertoire. What did you learn during your early military career that you feel like has helped you gain success? Something really simple. Write it down. Mm-hmm. Nothing or shattering. Make your list. Write it down. Because if, if my mind's wandering and I was thinking about the big picture, I'm going to forget if I don't write it down. I'm going to forget it. I'll, I'll, I'll get it like 80% right, but that 20% is what matters. So write it down. And, and so I think you have to look at every, – everyone has to look at themselves and figure out what do they have to do. You asked earlier about uh, four years, et cetera, and uh, it, we kind of joked about this earlier. I didn't have a better alternative. If I had a better alternative, I may have quit. <laughs> but I didn't have a better alternative. And so I'm going to keep doing until I find a better alternative. And, I, and I, I didn't look hard, but if a better alternative had come along, I may have taken it. But I can also tell you, like the current company I have, look, it's, like, it's been a hard for you. We're past that. But it, it was a pretty hard couple of years because things that I kept thinking were going to happen didn't happen. Or And it was really around, a lot of it was just being let down by people that kind of said, oh, they do this, they do that. Or I, I just believed in them. I believed in them too much. And by the way, this is not the core team. The core team has been, and you may have heard talk about this. I've worked with some really, really great people. And uh, and my platoons, et cetera, and um, Admiral McRaven and some others. And some, some were better than me. And I was better than some. But the current team I'm working with, everyone in their respective roles, every one of them is better than me. Like everyone. And that is a, that is a chance of a lifetime that I hadn't put in me. And so... And we kind of all stuck it out. And because of that, we're in the position where we are now. And But if it hadn't been that kind of that mutual respect for each other and not want to lay each other down, we probably would have quit. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm super grateful we didn't. We stuck together because of the core team that we just, we just kind of didn't want to let each other down, which is what, it, what it, like a SEAL platoon is. Like you have people in the SEAL platoon that don't get along or they, or they, or they don't agree on something. But there's – but you, the – Bad behaviors, whatever, or the, the disagreements stay in the platoon. Like it's, and by the way, I'm not saying you hide stuff, but you don't go talk about people poorly behind their back outside the platoon. If you have an issue with someone, deal with in the platoon. And um, so, and that philosophy is kind of when, with the, the team. We do a really good job of having direct conversations, not disrespectful, but having direct conversations. So, sure, I'm the CEO, but the team tells me, yeah, no, you're wrong, Jeff. Okay, great. Help me understand why. And by the way, I don't ask him in a challenging. I go, and I go, I'm not challenging. I go, but, but I'm asking to understand. Because there's always, it kind of goes back to the five whys. The initial re- my initial reason is probably not, my initial understanding is what, what they're saying is probably not. It's probably like this. Like, oh, yeah, you're right. Or, or maybe we get there and say, yeah, I agree with you, you're right, but we're going to do this anyway. There, there is a certain point where you have to step up and say, yeah, I heard you, but this is what we're going to do. And by the way, you can tell me I told you so when I'm wrong. You have that right. But we're going this direction now. Now, how did you learn that communication? I mean, what did you learn in the platoons that taught you guys all good communication? I don't know if it was learning the platoon. I think it's just over life. I, I remember, <laughs> and this is early on when I platoons, and, um, and being... Being an officer in the platoon, you're not necessarily the one with the most experience. Your job is to plan the mission and get people to the target to do their job. That's your job. Your job is to make sure that you, you get everyone there. So if you need to breach a door, you get the breach to the front door or the door they need to get to. If you need to get your sniper there, your job is to get the sniper there. Your job is not to take the shot. Your job is not to do the breaching. Your job is to get there. My point, man, we were on a patrol once. And we're patrolling, and he did the signal for rally point or to to rally, or to to circle up. I was like, I was like, hey, I was kind of like, hey, dude, what the hell are you doing? You, that that's my job to do that. And I was like, and I and I kind of reflected really well. I was like, what the hell did I just do? Like, I, I think I got to be so much control that I can't tell the point man. The point man has I have to tell the point man when to circle up. Like, no, he's the guy walking leading patrol, and he may have a question. Like, he may say. We don't know where we're going or anything else. Like, so you've got to be, you got to get out of your ego and say, yeah, there's lots of good questions out there and you don't have them all. And there's lots of good answers and you don't have them all. 
And so it was like embarrassing moments like that where I don't know if it came out. I don't know if I actually said that, but it, it went through my head. And then I reflect as like, where did that come from? And this was when I was in my 20s, but it was definitely my ego speaking. And it was, it was me not being comfortable in what I was doing. It was me not being comfortable of letting go. It's okay to let others be right. And it's okay to ask questions. And it's okay for others to be smarter than you. Like, all oh, that's okay. You guys just want, you just want to be the team, the kickball team that wins. Like, that's it. <laughs> I do got to ask you because I, I did read all of his books. What was it like working alongside Admiral McRaven? Funny. You're the first person to ever asked me that, I think. Really? <laughs> yeah. I think of him every morning. I wake my, I make my bed. <laughs> oh, so do I. <laughs> By the way, so do I. Uh, it's funny. Like, I make up my bed. I'm like, I'm Admiral McRaven. Yeah, and, every uh, morning. And sometimes and so, I'll walk, like, I'll get up to walk past the bed, and that speech goes in my head, and I got to go back, and I'm like, I got to make the bed. I got to feel accomplished. <laughs> this is, I don't want to say this is a loaded question, but this is a loaded question for me. There were some calls that I made that he didn't necessarily disagree with. And I never went back and said, oh, I was right. And there, there was an event where that happened, and a couple people, like, I had someone come up to me 10, 15 years later that said, Thanks for making that decision because I would have died that night. And there were some calls that were made in the field, et cetera, where I, 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 in hindsight, I made the right call. But Admiral McRaven was absolutely right to, tell, to, to say, yeah, you needed to do that. Because he, in his role, he needed to tell me that. Because it actually made me better. Because I thought about that. I thought, I thought about that for 15, 20 years afterwards. I kept going back and thinking about it. How could I have done it better? What could I have done better? And I and I literally replayed that event time and time and time and time again. I had some people say, dude, you got to get over that. But I kept thinking about that and I kept getting better and better and better solutions. So I kept thinking these contingency plans. I would do this. I would do that. And it wasn't just like that decision better. It was what are the steps I needed to do beforehand? It's like the one guy who said, I, I, oh, I would have died that night. Well, how did the chief and I put him in the position that he thought he was going to die that night if I didn't make a different call. Like, that's the first failure. So I give, my, I give myself credit for having the gut to say, no, like, we're going to, someone's going to die if we do this. Okay, so my gut was right. But the failure was not making sure this guy was, was prepared in the first place. That's where the chief and I let him down, failed. But like, that's a, it's a learning. It's not a failure, it's a learning. And so because McRaven pushed me hard, he he made me better. A lot of the people said, "Oh, I made the right call, right call." And McRaven McRaven had me in the next day saying, "Like, I mean, there's a lot lot the whole thing." He wasn't necessarily an easy guy to work for, but man, I respect him so much because um, he made me better. And and that and that has applied to, to going forward today. And I hadn't seen it for 20 years. I told maybe one or two people on this, but I was uh, he did a keynote at an event, um, big event in hospitality space. And I hadn't seen him for a long time. And I talked to him maybe once or twice. I talked a couple of times before that. And the head of the HLA or the number two guy greeted him. We were both on the stage greeting him and he shook his hand. And he came up to me and, and said, I put my hand and shake him and he gave me a hug. And, uh, and if you look at the picture, like I grabbed that guy so hard. Weird as it sounds, I needed that hug from a craven. And by the way, you don't ever hire, you don't ever hug a four-star admiral. Like you don't ever. And so like I hear people call him Bill McCrave and I'm like, oh no, it's admiral for me. And it's yes, sir. Like I, and, and by the way, I have admiral friends and I call them by their first name, but not Admiral McCraven. Like you just don't call that guy Admiral McCraven. So I, I have a ton of respect for him. And uh, even though it's just, he probably didn't even realize it, but just like I, I needed that hug from him, which is kind of like the, the, the moral story is if you see someone needs a hug, just, just give him a damn hug. But, but like that, him giving me a hug, just kind of let all that rumination saying it's okay because it made me better thinking about it. But he also said like, hey, we're not always going to get it right. And we just keep trying to get better and better. And that was his goal. How do we get better and how do we keep taking these things through? And so that was one of the things. So like John, JP, John Paul DeHorio taught a lot of language. But Craven taught me, learn from the past and keep making it better. Keep making it better. Keep making it better. Keep pushing Keep pushing. There's so many things that he brought to the table. And by the way, he was not liked by everyone. But I had an executive um, 
who who I worked with, and I was going to meet one of the top executives at, at Pepsi. And Carla Cooper was the person. She goes, oh, yeah, you can use my name here. Like, you, I, I got along with, with him. She goes, but you can't use my name everywhere. Or you can't use the introductions. Like, so not everyone's going to like you. And, um, and that's okay. And so um, you're going to have people and you could hear some people say, oh, I didn't like McRaven or whatever else. Or you'll hear people like that say they love McRaven. Or you'll hear other people say, oh, I like that guy or that gal. You're not going to be liked by everyone. But you can learn from everyone, the ones you like and the ones you don't like. So back to your original question, I am so grateful for working for Admiral McRaven. Like, so grateful. Like, there is so many talented people that came out of that time when um, John McTie was the CEO that McRaven replacing them McRaven. Harwood came after after them. Like, there's so many talented people that came out of SEAL Team 3 at that time. And most people will never know about them. But they set the stage for a lot of good things. And I mean, I mentioned one of the guys earlier. So I went on to do some like legendary things in the undersea world. And um, he just recently retired. And But um, yeah, a lot of talent that most people will never know about. And by the way, they were undiscovered talent. Most people never know about them because they weren't there. But they, they, they either did stuff directly or they helped train or lead other people to do great things later in life. So grateful to work for the guy. It's interesting that you say that because, I mean, as I told you earlier, I worked for Penny Marshall, and that just it just reminded me of that because it's like some people hated her, some people loved her, but in the end, it was just like, you know, you're, a lot of us are just grateful to have that opportunity. It was very, very relatable, even though it's two totally um, different environments, totally different yeah, people. I, it's yeah. the same. It, it's the same. Like, And, and that's, that's like so... I talked about earlier, learning the language of supply chain or sales or marketing. It, it, it's still the same. It's just skinned a little bit different. So I was asking everyone the final question of the show. What do you ha- advice do you have for us uh, civilians, everyone listening to the show, that we can do on a daily basis to develop our mental strength to face the challenges that are coming our way or be able to not quit when, you know, we want to take the easy road. I don't know if I have, like, I should have some whimsical saying, like, oh, go go brush your teeth twice a day or or make your bed. McRaven took that one. And start your day. And so um, I'm going to deviate real quick. Even McRaven learns off that story because I've I've seen him give the speech about making his bed or why he does it. And as it evolved, he started becoming more in touch of why he did that. And, uh, and he started becoming more sharing of making his bed, et cetera, and what it, what it meant to him. He probably already knew, but I think everyone just, just try and be a little better. Like, and, uh, like, and we all have ups and downs. Like, we all have times where we're doing great in life. And there's times where, where every one of us go, man, life sucks. <laughs> it's horrible. But that'll end. Like, and, and if you're struggling and you're like, I don't know how to, fu- I can't figure out how to get my way out of the box, go get help. Nothing wrong with getting help. Nothing wrong with admitting you're not the smartest part in the room, person in the room, or not. Nothing wrong with saying I need help or anything else. But I will say, at the end of the day, you have to do it yourself. You have to do it yourself. Like my current company, I intentionally didn't take money early on because I didn't know if I could do it. I didn't know if I could pull it off, and so I wasn't going to take someone else's money to start the company and keep it going. And so I put my own money in. If I'm not willing to bet on myself, then then why do it? So I, I think that, I think the back to the original point, that the wonderful thing is don't be afraid to bet on yourself. And by the way, you're not going to get it right every time and you're going to stumble, get back up, keep going. You're going to fall down again, get back up, get back up, get back up. It's going to be okay. Just, and we're 85, 90 years old, just, Hopefully you can say back, yeah, I gave it my best shot. And by the way, it doesn't mean you got it right every time, but just you just gave it your best shot. So, and I think the, the last thing is I just hope I pass it on to my kids. Just do your best and, and no regrets. That was really good. And that was so relatable to me because um, yesterday I had that, man, life just sucks and it's hard. And then I just realized, like, the people that I talked to on the show, like, I have someone coming. I have one person from the show that like lost his legs. And I'm just saying to myself, 
There is just, you know, and then I had another person who's like, kid is in the, IC, uh, the NICU fighting for their life. And I'm just saying to myself, oh, gosh, like, Gina, just keep on going. Like, you're fine, you know. But um, I, I, some days you just, you have, you have to be able to pick yourself up and, and go. So that was perfect for, for me, at least. I hope other people got something out of it. And I just want to thank you so much for talking with me and being on the show. You were really fantastic. Thank you. The best part was hearing about you before we started. Like, I <laughs> like, like, like seriously, you. like, I, I, I love what you're doing. I love what you're launching pretty soon. Um, and I don't know if you could talk about it, but I, I, I like the quick questions I asked, like, oh, yeah, that's a pretty good idea. And, uh, and I hope I hope the market plays out for you on that. And I hope the people you have to go visit for that um, recognize what you're doing, because I think you definitely you're as Penny Marshall said to you, like you're good in front of the camera, et cetera. And in that part, like that's about like that's the same thing as putting the product. You're figuring out a product that, that belongs in front of front of people that people will want to engage with. So I, I please keep me loop on that because I'm definitely. definitely curious, definitely curious to hear how that goes. So fascinating. So I'm, I'm really glad that we had some time before the show to talk about what, about you. Definitely, no, I, I really enjoyed talking with you. I talk, enjoyed talking with you the whole entire time. And um, everyone that's listening, please like, share, comment, subscribe, become a Substack member, and help me keep this podcast going. Thank you guys so much, and I will see you all next week.